Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today, we welcome Brad Rosen, the COO and co-founder of Nodar, a leading provider of next-generation stereo vision technology. You know, technology developments in agriculture continue to create effective ways for automation and sensing, providing farmers with useful information and working to improve operation efficiency. Today, Brad and Monty discuss the power of this type of sensing technology that Nodar has developed. It's a great conversation, so let's jump right in. Well, welcome everyone to this episode of the Ag Emerge podcast. I'm joined today by Brad Rosen with Nodar. Welcome, Brad. How are you today? Great. Nice to be here. Well, Brad, um, first time we've met. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, We have a little bit of a serial entrepreneur guest here today on the podcast. Uh, Tell us your story and and, um, kind of some of your background and what brought you to uh, Nodar here today. Great, thanks. Um, well, I'm 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 a technologist at heart. You know, I, I started off with an engineering degree, went and wrote software. Um, actually, writing sensor software for Pacific Gas and Electric out on the West Coast, uh, doing photovoltaic research. Uh, but then I quickly got the startup bug, and um, so I've done a, a series of um, of startups some of which have been sort of hard tech sensors, uh, all of which have exited in some way, shape or form. And once you go through that process, it it becomes addictive for many of us. Uh, so um, I I went and got a business degree at MIT. Um, I've, I've been a part of seven venture back startups. Um, yeah, and I just, I love uh, my particular passion, I would say, and, and um, sweet spot is is marrying a an emerging technology with a market need and um kind of seeing the path to to getting to getting that into the market and finding you know product market fit we say there you go and talk to us a little bit about just let's say sensors in general you know because you've had a lot of experience in that why are sensors so important and, and what does that mean and why why should farmers be interested in that? Because uh, backfill, why that's so important to the future of decision making. Yeah, well, sensors are nothing new, right? We have sensors all around us. Our cars have tons and tons of sensors down to like now knowing when your seatbelt is in or knowing uh, if you're using an automated following system on the highway, cruise control, knowing if there's too much dirt on the sensor, you know, the thing uh, says, I, I'm not getting enough information. I need to quit. Right. So we're, we have sensors all, all around us. And, um, in the, in the domain of farming, uh, there are myriad applications where the machines need to sense their environment, both for safety, for efficiency, you know, uh, uh, what's the quality of the grain? How far is the sprayer from the ground? Is the machine tracking properly? Is the um, the the tilling machine uh, clogged up? You know, the, it just the more sensing and information the farmer is getting, the more efficient the operation. Um, so bringing that back around, you know, um, there's a, a a groundswell around us related to automation, right? Not just in farming, but, you know, automotive, rail, construction, uh, warehouse automation. I mean, Amazon is all robotics these days. And all of these automated machines, we can call them generally robots. Even a car is a sort of a robot. Um, they need to be able to sense their environment and be, to move around in the environment. And so that requires a very sophisticated sensor. And there are um, different types of sensors, right? And so there are really, really simple sensors that simply sense like temperature or whatever based on um, 
you know, the electrons flow through a particular material, but there are also visual sensors and light-based sensors. And so one category you've probably heard of that's popular is LIDAR. Um, LIDAR uses lasers and it sends out a laser which bounces off things in the environment and come back. And then the speed at which those photons come back is proportional to the distance. So we can establish the distance uh, between the machine and the environment and LIDAR is effective. It's also very, very, very expensive um, as you'd imagine. It's, you know, we're measuring light here. Um, and then there's cameras, which are amazing, right? And we, you know, there's many billion of cameras sold every year, right? So the cost curve has gone like that. Cameras are super cheap. The performance curve has gone like that. You know, we have 12 megapixel cameras these days, which is kind of off the charts. Our phones have incredible cameras. So just like kind of backing into what Nodar does, uh, we we estimate depth or uh, th we provide 3D sensing around a vehicle using these incredibly high resolution photosensitive cameras. And the way we do that is like the human eye. Uh, we compare a left image and a right image and the shift of each object in the scene between those two images is proportional to distance. So if you close your left and your right eye, you'll see the scene shift left and right and things way far away shift a little bit and things right next to you shift a lot. And it's very simple. It's been used since the 1800s and we found a way to make it better. And so there are many applications of using two cameras to automate a large variety of farming equipment. So that that's really interesting when we talk about LIDAR and like you said, expensive and there hasn't been the the uh, rapid development right in, in that it's it's kind of a, a somewhat static uh, sensing, but it's great for, let's say, terrain imaging or kind of one off type applications. But, you know, the early when, you know, most people are probably familiar with automated car driving. Right. So that that's been there's been various companies that have gone down the LIDAR route to probably many of the big three automakers have gone that way um, where Tesla um, was kind of unique in that uh, they didn't go that way. They went with more of the vision cameras type right. sensing, figuring that, uh, well, you know, human eyes have worked all this time. <laughs> why, why shouldn't, uh, you know, visual sensors work for, for driving and, and can interact and understand the environment better. So Talk to us a little bit about some of the, um, and I think it's interesting on your, on your webpage, when you go to vision sensing, uh, versus LIDAR sensing, some of the inherent advantages that you have in that when you're working in farm conditions, which farm conditions include, uh, dust and, you know, limited visibility type scenarios, um, Share how that that difference there in, in LIDAR versus vision sensing. Yeah, dust is a great example. I, I love dust, particularly not only because we we perform a lot better than LIDAR and dust, but, but also because, you know, farming is dusty, uh, especially in the Midwest of the U.S. And so, um, yeah, this let's compare LIDAR and, and cameras for dust. So a LIDAR, like I said, it sends out a pulse of light. And uh, the problem with dust, of course, is it's literally dirt particles in the air, right? And so you can't see through dirt. And so when a photon from a LIDAR hits a piece of dirt, it bounces away, right? So the LIDAR has to rely on the photon hitting the target in the scene and coming back through that dust cloud. Well, the likelihood it's going to get disturbed, either going to the scene or coming back from the scene to the sensor is much, much higher than if we're just putting a static um, uh, CMOS sensor, which is which is a camera, which, which has uh, up to like 50 times the number of pixels as a LIDAR, just comparing apples to apples. The likelihood we're going to get uh, information from the scene about distance is significantly higher. And so, we did exhaustive testing in the Midwest on harvesters, and we simulated dust by using, because um, there wasn't a lot of dust the day we were doing it, we used cement mix, and we blew it with a blower into the air to simulate a dust cloud, and you couldn't see through it. And, and our technology performed between 2x and 6x better than 
the LIDAR in those conditions. So just by virtue of having super high resolution receptacle or receiver, uh, we're able to perform much, much better in a dusty environment. Then, then there's just the basic idea. Most of the LIDARs are spinning. They have spinners, right? So the lasers, uh, you have basically one laser per line or channel typically. So multiple lasers spinning really, really fast, painting the scene with photons. And um, that spinning mechanism breaks. It breaks after about 7,000 hours, give or take. And so if you imagine a, an automated piece of farming equipment that's running 24 seven nearly, like that's one of the benefits of automation is that you can run the equipment much longer you're gonna to have to replace those LIDARs quite often, maybe maybe yearly or once every two years. Whereas a camera-based system is entirely solid state. It's just got two cameras and a CPU and it won't break for like 10, 15 years. So those are two of the key benefits. And then of course, with optoelectronics and a LIDAR, we touched on cost, but the LIDARs are significantly more expensive. And I think farmers that have done any sort of uh, grading or tile work, they can relate to the fact of using a laser for for reference that you get a hot day. Uh, the thermals come off there will bend the laser. And, you know, in the afternoons, you can't level as good as what you can in the mornings. Um, so there, there's, yeah, there's lots of inherent problems there. More expensive, yeah, maintenance and those kind of things. So great. Mm -hmm. We've got, we've got a great, great uh, uh, part of a solution, right? But how does that plug into uh, the overall solution to we want to automate machinery, right? Because it's too hard to find good operators that can make good decisions and not have to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they, they have to sleep. They have to go to the bathroom. They have to eat lunch and, and those kind of things. How does this, how, what part does this play in the whole ecosystem to solve a operator list machine? Well, this kind of touches on the application space. Like what are the different applications that it makes sense to automate? And uh, there are several that we are working on. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll kind of list a, a few. Um, one of the main things, you know, a harvester goes along and it picks up wheat and it processes it and it spits it out into a grain following machine, right? Uh, I don't know what that's called, vehicle truck machine, but there's a separate vehicle following along and there's a spout that needs to align with the bucket i'm sorry that i'm using the wrong words no i, I I'm, I'm, I'm getting a kick out of it i'm sure i'm a software guy too. sorry that, that's great uh <laughs> we uh <laughs> we we appreciate that you're making this process simpler so continue on <laughs> right okay so anyway i apologize um so the, the alignment of that spout is very important, obviously, and these trucks are rattling around. And so um, stereo vision cameras can be used to align the spout to detect exactly in space where that uh, following machine is and where the spout needs to be. Uh, and so that's, a, that's an active application that's in use today. So that's a good example. Um, another example... And if I can interrupt, I mean, the current technology today is essentially using an AB line out of the harvester uh, and then with an offset to send an AB line over to the auger cart, the the catch vehicle, uh, in order to to parallel. Uh, now, there is some some stereotypic, um, you know, in freehand that is available out there, but this would make that process completely, um, you wouldn't need communication between machines, correct? Exactly. They're not machine linked each machine's capable to make that decision on their own. Absolutely. And if, if, if the, if the, you know, if they got out of alignment sufficiently where the spout couldn't effectively get the grain into the auger cart, then, uh, then, you know, it'd be easy with this system to alert um, the driver or the automated system to pause and make a correction. So that, that's one example, you know, and then another example is, um, you know, D John Deere has this new precision sprayer system which is super cool. I saw it at CES recently and it's got like 50 stereo cameras across it and it basically targets the spraying of um, fertilizer and pesticides, right? And so uh, the, the reason stereo cameras are used is to detect the exact height, the optimal height of the boom from the ground. And also computer vision is used to identify the plants and their structure and, uh, locate exactly where to precisely send the spray and the savings is 
significant, right? It's dramatically reducing the amount of fertilizer that's used. So that's a savings to the farmer. It's a it's an environmental benefit. I mean, it's like a huge win in that application. And then of course, there's like general guidance applications. So one that we're working with uh, across a couple of very large farming equipment vendors is um, swath or windrow following. So the idea that there are the, the the equipment creates humps that the that the next equipment can follow. The hump is the swath, uh, and there are some new automated systems uh, out there and in development. Uh, some of them are using lidar to identify the swath and uh, guide the tractor to follow it, so the the farmer can pay attention to other things, or it can be fully automated. So. The benefit of using a NODAR based system is that we can see over twice as far as a LIDAR can and our resolution is 10 to 50 times that of a LIDAR so we can detect a much smaller swath um, and we can and the benefits to the farmer are that we can drive the tractor twice as fast almost uh, and accomplish the same task with fewer errors, higher accuracy, etc. So let me ask you this, um, you know, I, I've come to appreciate just simple automated steering uh, in really dusty conditions. So I'm thinking uh, when I just so happen to have the field and is lined up perfectly with the wind uh, cutting soybeans. And, you know, it, it's been situations where you literally can barely see the ends of the, of the header. Um, there's still a, a thing where me as a farmer operating machine, i I know what's in the field. I kind of know what's going up next. I'm kind of reverting back to previous vision sensing events, right? And, and previous operating years. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we allow, because even, you know, I was looking at your extremely dusty conditions, you can identify 50% uh, of the objects, right? So there's still 50% that you can't identify. How do we close that gap when we get to truly autonom autonomous to be able to operate in those conditions where, you know, hey, I'm like, I know what's out here. I'm going for it because I, I remember on the previous pass when I could see what was going on. How how do we close that gap to get to true autonomy and not get constant alerts to the farmer saying, oh, uh, machine such and such has stopped? Um, what 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 is that remaining fifty percent that we have to get to on that, Brad? Yeah, I like the question. Um... You know, as a driver of a car, right, if we if we come into foggy conditions, you know, we we first of all, we know roughly the shape of a road and whatnot, but it becomes dangerous. And what do we do when it gets when the visibility goes down? It's not like a a, a, a switch that's on or off. Right. We slow the car down. We slow the car down. We start looking for the late the lane marking on the right. We put our our lights on our fog lights on, et cetera. We, we provide, you know, support and eventually we stop the car. Right. And so I would expect that this is how farming equipment will operate and, um, and it will improve over time. So as the resolution of cameras goes up, you know, as we add things like infrared sensors, other forms of sensing, which, which by the way, at NODAR, we work with infrared sensors as well. Um, will increase what we call as the ODD, the operational design domain, like the environment in which the system can operate effectively. So it's a continuum. It's a continuum. And with, with NODAR, we're going to work, you know, six times more often than a LIDAR will work in dusty conditions. So that's a starting point. Mm -hmm. And another, just to address one of the things, because you said as a human, you kind of remember what things look like on the last pass. Well, uh, with with these three D systems, we can localize the scene. We can build a map of what's happening in real time, and we can use it. Um, and that's called localization. And and that's a that's an active thing in automotive and 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 farming and in all areas of computer vision. And I really like your idea. What you're saying there about the infrared sensors, because that can be significant for safety. So we yeah. can have. Uh, sensors on equipment that can detect uh, maybe bearings that are getting hot or piece of equipment that get hot to prevent a fire. Uh, we can also look at, um, you know, people and animals have a, have an infrared signature that we're, 
we can see that clearly even in in all conditions right so yeah uh, that, now we we uh you know just to be clear at nodar we actually like infrared has many many uses it's incredible technologies but the cameras are so powerful photosensitive and high resolution these days the use the required uses of infrared is going down we're you know on a piece of million dollar farming equipment yeah let's throw the infrared sensors on it doesn't really matter what they cost and it provides more information but we don't think it's necessary for most uses okay good to know at the, that the uh, vision is getting that much better yeah so there's a saying in in startups hardware is hard <laughs> <laughs> so that is um, true. I've learned it over and over and over. And, and that's the space you've been in. Uh, talk to us a little more now about the uh, what it's like in the startup world and and why that's important and and why why are we always looking for someone to exit to and 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 purchase our product to make it a part of their their total suite. Talk a little bit of the startup mentality and and, and all right, what, shifting gears. What's yeah, it like? To, what's what's it like to be at a startup and, and run a yeah. startup? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, this is this is the exciting part. You know, um, it, it's uh, you know, being at a startup is like a roller coaster, right? You know, you you have an idea, and then when you first see a customer, kind of say, "Hey, that's a good idea. I would pay money for that." Like the 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 rush is substantial, uh, and and so we kind of at the startup we learn to that's the carrot, so we learn to seek that. The ultimate carrot, of course, is to, you know, somehow um, get paid for your risk, for your risk and the work you put in, you know, so we look for the reward and the reward can take various forms. Obviously, what I just described to you, like having a customer pay money for your thing is an initial reward that's very, uh, it's fun, but um, getting paid money comes in the form of either like building a big business that throws off cash and you can pay yourself enough money to support your family. Like that can be some people's goal. Another person might want to take their company public, right? That's another way to create liquidity and money and payment for your hard work. And then the third option is to sell the company to another company. And I'd say most successful startups end up in that option because an IPO is a massive endeavor and uh, takes a particular type of person. And then you need to be capable of scaling from tens of people to hundreds of people to thousands of people to get there. And then you got to want to go talk to Wall Street all the time. Um, whereas, you know, in, I don't know, three to 10 years, uh, if you create enough value in the market, um, you could find a partner that can use your product and will pay real rent or money for what you've done. And that's a nice way to create liquidity. So that's why a lot of entre entrepreneurs seek that. It's like pay ourselves less, bite the bullet, work super hard, harder than normal, I would say. And then, uh, but at the end, there's a big carrot in theory. I, I don't know. Did that answer the question? Oh, no, I think that's great. And I wanted to go in, you, you briefly mentioned there about uh, working really hard for a little bit less to to have that that larger exit to pay out in the end. Uh, you know, what is that saying? An entrepreneur is the only person who work 80 hours a week, so they don't have to work 40 hours a week. You right. know, that's, uh, yeah, that <laughs> that's resonates. How, <laughs> that's how that works. But uh, so why is it that large companies and, and we've picked on um, or brought up John Deere today a little bit. Why is it John Deere's would be interested in a, in acquiring this? Why don't they just uh, and I, I know the answer to this, but I'm I'm setting you up for it. Uh, why don't they just uh, develop these things themselves? Why are they purchasing uh, uh, a Blue River Technologies or or many other smaller startups um, versus and, and set up a whole essentially division with John Deere Labs? Why why are these large companies seeking this out versus doing it themselves? Yeah, I mean, there's there's several reasons. Um... I don't know if you've ever read a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. I guess maybe I'm aging myself out here, but back in the day, that was an important book. And, and basically, the summary is, you know, it's very hard for large companies to innovate, to get out of their own way and to do something truly disruptive. So whereas the, the smaller company, it starts from the ground up, you know, look at Tesla, it starts from the ground up, rethinks the problem, rethinks the solution. And in some ways, in a lot of ways, it's a lot easier 
to develop something truly disruptive. And so there are example upon example upon example of where this works. And so some large companies try to create like little innovative decision the divisions where they 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 foster innovation and sometimes that works uh but a lot of times uh they find a competitor a, a competitor out there that's building a competitive product but doing it in a new and innovative way like blue river and they say uh they look at what would it cost us to run after them and assemble a team of a thousand engineers and you know it's a five years and, uh, you know, $75 million to build that product. Um, so there's a time to market uh, consideration. And so they weigh that, you know, build versus buy. And that's why companies end up buying. Another reason they end up buying is just to gain staff, right? Expertise, which is very, very hard to find in the market. It takes a long time. So with one fell swoop, they can um, they can leapfrog competitors, uh, they can augment their staff with experts, and they can create a new product line uh, more rapidly. So that that's that's the consideration. Plus, they also have the distribution channels in place that likely who they acquired did not. So they, they've got the customers, they've got the way to get to that market. Oh, they, yeah. They, From you know, Blue so they can... perspective, it's a it's a it's a slam dunk because of those reasons. It's like our products is about to get into the market much more quickly because of John Deere. Mm -hmm. Right. Just by simply painting it green and putting that stamp on it, instantly increase the value of that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a way for, for the, the large corporation to put their, their branding value onto a, another extension or another product line. Yeah. No, it's not a slam dunk, right? Like companies like Cisco have become expert at subsuming uh, startups somewhat successfully, but it's really difficult to retain the staff in those situations. And it's always very difficult to integrate IT systems between one company and another larger, older company with a lot of legacy stuff. And so it can be very complicated to buy a company. Um, I think the other thing that's a very uh, big consideration is we all hear about, you know, since we've mentioned it, we all hear about Tesla, right? And, and how that's a success. We don't hear about the other 1,000 or 10,000 that tried and failed. Yeah. You know, they're out there. You know, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's not 1,000 or 10,000, but it's in the hundreds probably. Um, that that really de-risks it for an acquisition company to purchase something that is working. You know, so there was a lot of, uh, you know, angels and venture capital that went into a lot of things that just plain didn't work, right? Oh, totally. I mean... And and uh, even those that it does seem like it's working. I mean, there's a look at Fisker, Rivian, Scout, BYD, like all of these new companies attempting to outplay Tesla, Tesla's game now. Some of them are not going to make it. You know, some have gone public and uh, are struggling because building a car is really freaking hard. Well, and uh, today it hit the news. I, I don't know if this is 100% true, and, and this will depend now at the time of recording, we'll find out, but Apple pulled the plug on their, on their I read that. car. Uh, I read that. So just that happened. makes me sad. I'm not sure why, but it makes me sad. I know they put a lot of effort into it, and it's always an exhilarating experience to see a new Apple product. Like, I wanted to see what they would do. Sure, sure. But I think it's it's interesting to see that even, you know, what the largest capitalized com company on planet earth couldn't pull it off. So I, I think that's a matter of, that's why it's key to find, you know, four OEMs that, that have a product that they want to improve the performance efficiency to, to I identify a nodar with a, a product that is working that can enhance them. And that's, that's why this exit process works so well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And in, in our case, I mean, we, we, we don't mince our words. Like we, work with equipment makers, right? And that's automotive equipment makers, farming equipment makers, rail equipment makers, whatever. Uh, and uh, so our, you know, we, we spend time understanding what farmers need and how they do their work. Uh, and then we spend time with the OEMs, the equipment makers to understand their product roadmaps. And we, we work very closely with them to figure out you know, it's no doubt the right technology. How might it be used? And um, these dialogues are super important. 
So you just mentioned several different industries there that are really separate from each other. Do I kind of hear that uh, long-term you think your play is likely licensing to each one of these individual industries is, is where yes. you'll be? Yeah. Yeah. We, um, and business model is an interesting question, right? It always is for a startup, but for us in particular, we started, we are a software company. Our technology is software that analyzes those images I talked about, right? And produces these beautiful depth maps, 3D maps in real time. Um, but, but a but lot you of- you still have to have that hardware in exactly. in order to utilize the software exactly. that you're creating. I mean, that's exactly. that's a little bit of a catch in your- Right. Because the, that, that hardware isn't just readily- out there in, in, in the in the world, correct? Exactly. So uh, depending on who the customer is, the customer may not have the sophistication or the wherewithal to build the hardware. And in those cases, we've assembled the groups of partners that build the hardware for us and we'll sell a complete package. But, uh, you, know, outs you know, outsourcing or uh, sourcing, you know, the hardware, but in the case of some of the large, for instance, farming equipment providers, whether it's Deer, Agco, TAFE, CNH, these guys all do have the wherewithal to uh, uh, to source cameras to build hardware. And, and so in those cases, we are very amenable to just licensing our software mm -hmm. and working with them on the hardware configuration. Like we have a reference design. We say, this is what we recommend. Then we integrate it. Yeah. And the other struggle you run into too, is we have uh 20 year life cycles, maybe instead of five year life cycles on equipment. So there has to be a lot of capability to retrofit uh, and, and work with, you know, maybe even pre CAN bus systems. And, and those, so there's lots of little nuances to figure out there, yeah. but yeah. you know, go, going forward, what in your mind, uh, I mean, there's lots of vision opportunities out there and such what, what makes it NODAR significantly different uh, we've talked a little bit about the significant difference between LIDAR and, and NODAR um, or vision sensing. What makes you significantly different than other vision sensing platforms that are that are in the space? I mean, I think using Tesla as an example is a great one because Tesla is outspoken about their vision focus and wanting nothing to do with LIDAR, which we love. Tesla takes a different approach than we do. Uh, we think ours is better. I'll explain why. But uh, Tesla, and this applies to farming, Tesla uses a monocular approach using a single camera. It's like closing your eye and trying to deduce depth, married together with AI, right? So they built their own chip that's uh, optimized to do neural networks. And just like the human brain, like if you close your eye, you still can kind of say, well, I, you know, that computer screen is, I know the rough size of it, therefore I can infer the distance. And that is actually how Tesla works, basically. You know, it is using a single uh, a single camera, eight of them or more around the car, and it's got a neural network behind each. And it's basically saying, I know what type of car that is and the size of it. I can infer depth or I can look at the shadow and figure out roughly what's going on geometrically in this scene and things like that. And then it's trained on uh, millions and millions of hours of data of previous driving scenes, right? And and then they, so basically they just try to infer the scene and operate accordingly. And that's great for 90, 95% of all driving scenarios, but it breaks down when it sees things it's never seen before. You know, like a an emergency vehicle that's sideways or diagonal to it, or a motorcycle at night, or, um, you know, the roadway markings uh, are covered and all of a sudden the car just doesn't know where it is, right? And so these are unfortunately uh, causes for documented fatal crashes. Um, I mean, I will say out of the gate, Tesla is the safest car on the planet right now, but they also have been, um, uh, they've also run into some safety challenges because of the, the way the monocular systems work. So with NODAR, so the difference is we use two cameras instead of one. And we we don't deduce or infer distance. We actually measure it using shift between images. It's extremely accurate. It's super fast. The downside is it requires an extra camera. So pluses and minuses. 
The Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. The ASN team is hands-on, digging in and invested in regenerative agriculture. Along with the proper plant nutrition and biologicals to boost your soil microbiome, we provide the ideas and implementation guidance to support you on your soil health journey. So stop farming the same way and contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. I didn't even know that. I, I I did not know that they were not comparing distances using the multiple cameras. I, I that to me that's just so simple. It just just sticks yeah. out like a sore thumb. And, and um, yeah. huh, I did not know the. Yeah. So in in, in, in that, that sense, we're matter. more like a lidar because a lidar is making a precise measurement. Mm-hmm. You know, if a lidar gets a valid measurement, you know, you can pretty be pretty sure that is an accurate depth measurement. Same with us. If we're getting uh, a valid. Uh, you know, if we're picking key points between the two images and we know it's the same point and the cameras are properly calibrated, which is which is one of our secrets, then we know we're getting a valid de- depth measurement. With, so that, uh, monoc- that, with a monocular system, it's not always the case. And you just hit on what I was going to ask next, you know, one of your secrets. So what is your intellectual property and, and how do you protect inside of this space? Well, the traditional way with patents, we have a slew of patents now that have been awarded, which we're excited about. And basically those patents, there's a pipeline, a technology pipeline. So images from cameras come into our system. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first thing we do is we have to align them to make sure they're perfectly aligned because the geometry that we do is, is dependent upon precise geometry. And if, uh, one camera's like this and the other's like that, that'll screw up our measurements. So we we align them, them in software using sophisticated algorithms and we do it super fast. We do it up to like 50 frames a second with super high resolution, like 5 million pixels per frame. So that's aligning them. Do you is have a question? A physical alignment then, or is that no. a software alignment? That software you're... alignment. Ah, there yeah, you go. That's... So, it, it, you know, it can be a little bit off and and you're going to auto auto align that so once you've gone through that process then you can exactly okay exactly we auto align it and then once that's done then we do the geometry uh to calculate the shift between the images which is called parallax um and uh or disparity and so we uh but it does depend on this incredibly precise calibration and that i mean if i distill nodar down to What's the most of our, what, what, what's our core secret sauce? It's that calibration. That was awesome. And so that, uh, you know, if you think about cameras, like they can vibrate this way, they can vibrate this way. They can like move around. There could be a shift at night because it's cold weather and the metal actually shifts. Like there's a lot of different ways cameras can move. And we're so dependent on knowing the relative pose of the cameras that this, um, it turns out there's like 22 dimensions that it needs to be optimized across. And 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 we've just figured out a way to do that problem very quickly. Plus when you're dealing with vibrations, you know, uh, um, angles, angle of attack when you're, you know, on terrain. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of, um, lots of issues there. So well, geometry. Ah, amazing. I should have paid better attention in, uh, you know, in trade class. But anyway, back to, uh, you know, one of the things and you mentioned it briefly that people talk about one of the greatest values to Tesla is this massive um, machine learning database that they're creating from having a vision sensors on hundreds of thousands of vehicles wandering around the U.S. Uh, collecting all that data. Um, is that you're, you're doing a similar thing too, correct? You know, you're, you're learning, you know, the cameras are learning themselves and, and you're learning the environment and response. What is the value of that? Help, help people understand why that's so important. First of all, let me um, make a correction. Okay. Uh, we are not a learning based system. We are okay. not using neural networks. We are doing things the old fashioned way with signal processing algorithms. Okay. Right. So uh, it's just really, really fast math. OK, uh, in our case. And we I think apologize. That, I misunderstood. No, it's, it's a great clarification. I should yeah. have said earlier. We think it's a huge benefit because, um, you know, they're known algorithms. Everything's repeatable and testable. 
If things fail, we know why they failed. With an AI system, it's not so clear. Uh, an AI, so an AI system benefits from all that training data, like you said. So that is a massive asset of Tesla's. The more and the more training data, the more clean training data they have to train the system, the better the system will get within the limits of the processing capabilities. Right? There's today the processor is the bottleneck. Uh, the reason Tesla isn't like a human brain and can't drive like a human can is because the processor is a is dwarf, dwarfed by the human brain. And so Tesla has to reduce the image sizes significantly just to be able to run them through the neural networks. And in doing that, they're losing a lot of the clarity in the scene. So the, these are some of the drawbacks. But you're right. That training data set is a huge asset. We don't have that drawback. So you're able to... Yeah, it just in real time make those decisions and not have to essentially peer back through time to figure out uh, we're we're, we're obzo observing what is really happening instead of uh, building based on past observations and assumption of what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, and when a, when a Tesla crashes, it's probably quite difficult to piece together exactly why certain decisions were made. Whereas with a Nodar based system, we know exactly millisecond to millisecond why anything happened um which helps all right so what's the future look like here when um um this you, you're enabled you have equipment uh, that's enabled with with nodar technology paint the picture what what it what all this is going to look like five years from now well i mean you, you mentioned it earlier there are there are there are shortages of folks that want to sit on tractors and um, and so I, I think um, rather than paint a vision of like an entire farm with no humans, um, which I think is a long way off, I do think there's economic benefit that will drive automation across a variety of applications on the farm. And in doing so, I think farmers will be able to do more with less resources and make more money at higher efficiency. Right. And so. I think we will see harvesters that can drive themselves, that can do a whole field uh, without a human. But I also think we'll see a reduction in pesticides and uh, and the use of uh, fertilizer just through like optimized spraying and these types of things. You know, so I think farmers will require less expertise, uh, can perhaps save money on uh, personnel costs um, and you know, across the board, elevate profits. How can vision be used for, and I realize this is beyond the scope of automation, but how do you see vision sensing being able to be used for crop analysis as far as plant health, yield? Uh, how, how well did we perform in order to have a feedback loop uh, for decisions in the future? Uh, how also could it be used to uh, automate the decisions of setting machinery to do certain functions? Uh, have have you explored any of that, or or do you know uh, some ideas on how those those things could could be integrated? This is not my area of expertise, and in fact, you know, if it's kind of beyond using computer vision for depth analysis, it's not what we do. But um, it is a fascinating conversation, and for sure, computer vision as a category um, can be applied to all the things you just mentioned, right? And uh, absolutely AI and neural networks are relevant in these cases, right? Identifying plants. Does that plant have a disease? What disease is it? What is that bug? What spray should we put, should we put on that plant at that precise point on the plant to address a particular issue? I mean, th these are all happening today. It's not even futuristic. It's happening today, and then and then the development of like little robots that can go around and do this uh, to 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 augment the staff of the farmer is is happening today. Um, so I you know I, I guess I don't I don't have much more to say on that topic, but I I I love learning about it. It's all within the realm of possibility, right? So this yeah. this is where we're where we're heading, and um, you know, I've I'm familiar with a company that has vision sensors inside of combines to know what is the real feedback of what's going on inside the machine as we're operating, yeah. and how do we yeah. how do we change it? So, yeah, yeah. There, there's lots of opportunities there. Um, well, we've had a lot of fun uh, um, 
explaining how how these things can work. What what else should I have uh, asked about Nodar and what you're what you're accomplishing there while we are together here today? Well, I guess I mean you've asked a lot, and I appreciate it. Uh, so it doesn't leave a lot uncovered, but um, you know, and you might you might ask, well, who are our customers? Like, where are we going to see Nodar? First? Yeah, yeah. Where is it? <laughs> we want to go out and buy it right now. No. <laughs> and and the truth is, I want to tell you so badly, but I, you know, these um, contracts that we sign have NDAs and, um, you know, it, it takes, it's, you know, it's roughly a 24 month development cycle. And, and so with a bunch of large farming equipment providers, we're in the early stages of developing product together. Uh, and I'm not I'm not yet able to talk about it. We're we're young enough that I can't really talk about it. We do have like publicly available um, announcements related to auto, well, automotive and the and the uh, we have a contract with the U.S. government for almost a couple million dollars uh, to develop infrared stereo vision systems for off-road environments, off-road harsh environments. So you can imagine, you know that that work certainly will come to bear in the farming area. Excellent. So are we on month one or month 23 of the 24 month? Can you even say that? Mm. It depends which company. Um, ah, okay. in, in some cases, we're, uh, we're 25% through the process. And in some cases, we're a little bit less. Okay. Well, good. So this is uh, definitely in the very near future. Uh, yeah, it definitely is. And and actually, I will say, like, we initially started in automotive, and we love automotive, because it's just, you know, it's a huge market, and there's lives to be saved there. Um, but we love farming, because the regulatory environment is much more, uh, I don't want to say lax, but relax as compared with automotive. And so it's much, the development cycle is much faster. Right. Because in automotive, the regulatory environment mandates you know, years of testing prior to any any new thing getting on the road. And in farming, I think we have more leeway. So we'll we'll be in the market much more quickly. Very interesting. I, I like the fact that you're going to, um, you know, you can start with some of the simpler tasks first, uh, but uh, there will still be a need for the farmer. Don't, don't feel bad, right? If you want to be out there driving the machinery, you'll still be able to do it. But it's uh, important to think about how we can integrate this as a part of our operation, because a lot of times when we get into the peak workloads, um, you know, fall, for example, we could use an extra person in the fall that you just can't use the rest of the year. Right. So yeah. there's, there's those kind of opportunities. Yeah. Well, Brad, uh, this is going to be what number number seven startup for you, is it? I think it might be number eight. Number eight. And I'd have to go. Exactly. I'd have to go number look. Eight. You know. So, uh, and what, there's some other little ones on. like that I did on the side too, like apps and things. Uh, yeah, know. those are just those. Don't, those are hobbies, right? <laughs> so, what do you think? Uh, uh, you're you're young, so this will you'll probably make it all the way up to about twenty or so successful exits, right? I don't know. I'm young. I like that you said that. I think the um, I think the uh, Zoom. Uh, wrinkle eraser is working very very well today <laughs> but no that's uh that's quite a quite an interesting um background you've had i mean i know a lot of people have unsuccessful exits so uh congratulations on on what you've done and and how you're you're bringing a product to market here to solve a specific problem and um, it, it's exciting to see how something can be simplified and improved at the same time so yeah. Hats off to you. Appreciate Brad. it. You uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the kudos. It's, a, right. long, it's a long road, but it's really, really exhilarating and fun. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing uh, uh, your hardware and your solution, uh, software solution on, on equipment in the, in the very near future. You'll see it. Thank you very much. All right, it. Brad, you take care. Have a great day. Cheers. Thanks for listening to this conversation. We strive to share new ideas and new technologies with you, and we appreciate the conversations around those technologies. It's just another way we can use these types of tools to help fine-tune our soil health journey. And as always, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help growers fine-tune their soil health systems, check out our website at asn.farm. And there, you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.